2020. Uh, we'll, Onsan City Council will be conducting this meeting using electronic means. Joining us in the council chamber here is Deputy Mayor Brian O'Leary, Councilor Richard Thomas, City Manager Wayne Ritchie, uh, uh, Clerk Brianna Bloomfield, uh, Deputy Clerk uh, Amy Atkinsweiler, all other council and staff members are joining us via video. I'd like to remind those of you who are joining the meeting from home to keep your microphone on mute unless you are speaking. Uh, when a council or a staff member wishes to speak, I would ask that you raise your hand and uh, wave it around and we hope to see it. I uh, will note who wants to speak and we'll address them um, when it is their turn. For each vote, I will ask each councillor whether they are in favor or opposed uh, so that those at home can hear how each member is voting. Unless a recorded vote is requested, uh, how each person votes will not be recorded in the minutes. For any councillor present through video that declares a pecuniary interest, please make sure to turn off your video for that item. Clerk will mute the microphone so that the person at home has virtually left the meeting. Once the item has been dealt with, the city clerk will unmute Mike so that uh, the councillor can rejoin the meeting. Those are the rules, apparently. Moving uh, right into the open session, we did not have a closed session tonight. Asking council if anyone has any additional business. I'm not seeing all the hands, so you know what? If you have additional business, I'm going to get you just to uh, speak up. Councillor Greg here. I do have one item. Anyone else? It is. It's on the purchase of the aerial fire truck. Thank you. Anyone else? John Tamming here. Um, I have a, a bit of a report on a couple of meetings I've held with Dr. Era, and I'd just like to speak to that at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay, I'm hearing none. Disclosure pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Mayor O'Leary, or Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Your Worship. There's a, on the city's city manager's report on item 12C, uh, there's one part of that on city layoffs that I recused myself from that meeting. So if there's any discussion on city layoffs, I'll be leaving. Thank you. Thank you. So that's going back to our uh, minutes from the special meeting that will come up. Um, I also have a pecuniary interest uh, 12B, I believe, which is the um, planning report. I have a client who will be affected by the decision we make um, properties that could be affected, so it's appropriate for me to leave. Confirmation of the council minutes. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on April 6th, 2020, as printed, be adopted. Thank you. Go through the list in favor, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Favor. Councillor Dodd. In favor. Councillor Gregg. Okay, he's waving uh, approval. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Councillor Merton. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. Okay, so that's carried. So that was the. 6A minutes of uh, April 6th, special meeting April 8th. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the minutes of the special meeting held on April 8th, 2020, as printed, be adopted. So in favor, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councillor Dodd? In favor. Councillor Gregg? In favor. No, Councillor Hamley? In favor. Councillor Kepke? In favor. Mr. Merton? In favor. Councillor Tamming? In favor. Councillor Thomas? In favor. Good, so that's carried. Down to number seven, motion to move council into committee of the whole. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thomas, 
that city council now move into committee of the whole to consider public meetings, deputations, and presentations. Public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of city staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, motions for which notice was previously given, and additional business. All in favor, Councillor Deputy Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councillor Dodd? In favor. Councillor Gregg? In favor. Councillor Hamley? In favor. Councillor Kepke? In favor. Burton. In favor. Mr. Hamming. In favor. Mr. Thomas. In favor. There we go. So that's carried. So uh, we are now in committee of the whole. We have no public meetings tonight. We have no deputations or presentations. Uh, public question period. I understand we did not receive any questions uh, today. Uh, so we move on to number 11, which is correspondence received for which uh, the direction of council is required. At this point, I'd like to uh, read a proclamation. Uh, many years ago, council decided that they weren't going to do proclamations and, uh, and giving of grants and things with the exception of one. Each year, the uh, council or the city of Owen Sound recognizes uh, uh, the, the proclamation I'm about today, uh, reads or a day of mourning. It would normally be tomorrow, it would normally be out at the flagpole, and we would have uh, various people from uh, the labor force uh, here talking about what they had seen and been through and injuries and things and uh, labor uh, parties and things. So, um, whereas every year more than 1,000 Canadian workers are killed on the job, whereas thousands more are permanently disabled, whereas hundreds of thousands are injured, as thousands of others die from cancer, lung disease, and other ailments caused by exposure to toxic substances at their workplaces. Whereas April 28th of each year has been chosen by the Canadian Labour Congress as a day of mourning for these victims of workplace. They remember the supreme sacrifice they have been forced to make in order to earn a living to renew approaches to governments for tougher occupational health and safety standards, more effective compensation, day to rededicate ourselves to the goal of making Canada workplace safer. I, Mary Ian Body of the City of Owen Sound, do hereby proclaim April 28th as an annual day of mourning in recognition of the workers killed and injured or disabled on the job. Down to uh, 12A, Mayor Larry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just I wanted well, to I speak. Guess, I guess I should be going to the report first, should I? Sure. Representing. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Annie, are you out there, Ms. Reed? Sorry. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Can we see you too. Great, thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Uh, the recommendations in the report are for Council to bring forward a bylaw to ratify the employment contract between the City and Timothy Simmons. Uh, and the second recommendation is for Council to bring forward a bylaw to amend the delegations of power and duties bylaw to reference the new City Manager's employment contract bylaw. The background in the report details the recruitment and selection process that has occurred to date, including the use of the executive search firm felt groups for the hiring of the city manager. Council has completed the recruitment in accordance with the schedule approved in October of 2019, which is outlined in the report. An employment contract was negotiated and has been signed by the mayor, the clerk and the successful candidate, Timothy Simmons. Mr. Simmons begins his new role on May 11th, 2020. And the current city manager, Wayne Ritchie, will be retiring from his position on May 15, 2020. The city's delegation and powers and duties bylaw needs to be amended to reference the new city manager's employment contract. Under the financial implications, it's noted that a salary of $190,000 was approved by council at the April 6, 2020 meeting. And under the communication strategy, it's noted that a notice to staff and a media release were distributed on April 23rd, 2020. Thank you. 
Thank you. Oh, Larry. Thank you, Worship. A couple of things here. Um, I've already uh, talked with council on this, but if everybody can remember uh, back a few months ago, I was pretty adamant that we didn't need a consultant to hire a new city manager. And I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, now that we've been through the process with the Phelps group, uh, with Heather and Jason, uh, I couldn't be more happy with the, the outcome, but the entire procedure was good. We had some excellent candidates and uh, not often I can speak on behalf of all of council, but I can, I can safely say that all of council is ecstatic about our new hire, Tim Simmons. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Annie for all her work in this. And uh, you know, with all that said, I'd also like to say that we're forever grateful for what Wayne Ritchie has done for us, the city and our employees for the past five years as well. So with that, your worship, I'd be happy to move the recommendation. Any other uh, comments from council? Seeing none, so I will call the question then. All in favor, starting with Deputy Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Dodd. In favor. Councillor Gregg. In favor. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Councillor Merton. In favor. Councillor Hamming. Real. In favor, sorry. Yes, in favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. Okay, so the 12A is carried. 12B is report from our uh, planner with regard to Heritage Grove. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Mayor Body is now leaving the room. I would ask for Amy to take over for this report, please. Thank you, Deputy I've Mayor. The meeting. Good evening, members of council, staff, and public. I'd like to give you a short presentation regarding the contents and recommendations of staff report CS20035, being a recommendation report for zoning bylaw amendment number 29 and site plan approval application 005. These applications seek to facilitate the build out of the large format retail commercial lands at 2125 16th Street East, also known as Heritage Grove. So given our report, I'll guide you through the relevant report schedules so that everyone can follow along together. So with regard to an explanation of the proposal, Schedule A in your agenda shows the nearly uh, built, built out uh, current state of the site. The PetSmart building that you see partially constructed on the site plan is now fully complete. So the uh, development proposed in the report before you this evening is towards the front or the north portion of the site. Schedule C of your agenda package shows the proposed development. The proposal being considered by you this evening uh, consists of several things, and I'll list them here. Construction of a 100-room hotel. Construction of four single-story detached commercial buildings having nine cumulative units, and three of which having outdoor patios. Construction of a communal parking area, including site access, sidewalks, and loading areas. Connection to necessary servicing and installation of necessary site amenities, including landscaping and waste enclosures. To facilitate this development, the applicant is requesting an amendment to the city's zoning bylaw and site plan approval. Moving on to the policy framework, Schedule B in your agenda shows the policy framework impacting the subject lands. The property is designated East City Commercial, and is located within the Sydenham Heights Phase 1 planning area in the city's official plan. The lands are zoned C2 or retail commercial with special provision 1489 in the city's zoning bylaw. Special provision 1489 very specifically sets out the permitted uses and the site and building regulations applying to the lands. The applicant is requesting an amendment provision uh, in the recommendation report before you this evening. So Schedule E in your agenda package shows a redlined version of Special Provision 1489 for your review. This was the best way that we could illustrate the changes. 
The amendment proposes to add a gas bar and hotel as permitted uses on site. It proposes to allow building H, with, which is the most northwesterly building on site, uh, to be set back four meters from 16th Street East instead of the, instead of the required six meters. The amendment proposes to allow the hotel to be up to 19 meters or roughly five stories in height, which is the same as clinics and laboratories are currently permitted on site. The amendment is also requesting to Increase the amount of small restaurants on site to a cumulative 520 square meters instead of the current permit 464 square meters. So the small restaurants, uh, of course, are those which are size 325 square meters or smaller. And finally, the applicants requesting to allow for one drive through restaurant, which is not subject to the small restaurant cap. Moving on to site design and aesthetic, in accordance with the official plan, staff were particularly interested in the visual appeal of the site given its predominant location at the Highway, highway 26 gateway to the city. Schedule H in your agenda shows the perspectives of the site from 16th Street East. Uh, these were a special ask. We, we do hope you find these helpful. Uh, it was our hope, and I think that you'll find the perspectives and the site plan together show how the buildings address the street, the comprehensive landscaping provided on the site, screening of the drive-through vehicle queue, the thorough pedestrian connectivity over the entire site, and the waste enclosures and loading areas which are located to the rear of all the buildings, so will not be vis visible from the Highway 26 or 16th Street East corridor. In our opinion, all of these items contribute to the aesthetic appeal and functionality of the site. With regard to the market study and peer review, for large format retail and service uses, a proponent must undertake a market impact study and support, to support a zoning bylaw amendment in the East City commercial designation. Schedule F in your agenda package uh, contains the original market study prepared by Urban Metrics on behalf of the applicant. And Schedule G contains the Tate Economic Research Peer Review with its addendums, which were prepared on behalf of the city. The peer review, uh, as you'll see, does support the zoning bylaw amendment as proposed. In conclusion, uh, relevant to the zoning bylaw amendment, the following was completed in accordance with the Planning Act. Uh, number one, notice of complete application and public meeting were given uh, to the public and prescribed bodies. Number two, a uh, public meeting was held on August 12th, 2019. Number three, written and oral submissions were made and considered and addressed in this report. Number four, commenting agencies were consulted through each submission as appropriate. And number five, notice of council's decision on the proposed amendment will be given in, in accordance with the act. So in conclusion, after extensive review of the facts of the application, public and agency comments received, site design and engineering details relevant to site plan control, and finally, the planning policy framework, staff is of the zoning bylaw and application and the site plan approval application subject to conditions. Uh, and I'll conclude with that, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Amy, for that thorough report. Uh, any questions or comments from council? We'll begin with uh, Councillor Thomas. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. I'd be happy to move those recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Any other comments or questions from Council? Tamming here. I just want to thank you, Ms. Can, for um, your diligence when it comes to the aesthetics of that site. I think it's important to keep that in mind. And I've noticed that you in particular and Pam are very keen to do that sort of thing. So kudos to you guys. Keep it up. Thank you, Councillor Tamming. Anyone else wish to speak or comment? Go ahead, Scott. Deputy Mayor, uh, it, uh, first question is, it, will the hotel also have a restaurant in it? 
Thank you for that question, Councillor Greg. Um, the hotel will not contain a, a standalone restaurant. It may contain uh, facilities for, for accessory or continental type food provision, but uh, not a standalone restaurant. Okay. Um, I, I have a little bit of, well, first, namely the highway was there first, so I have a bit of a problem with um, us changing the setback from a six meter setback to the four meter. Um, they purchased the property knowing the six meter setback is likely something consistently applied to uh, all properties along Highway 26. And there's probably a good reason that there's considerable setback maintained along the highway. Also, uh, the fact it's a drive through, I kind of struggle with because. To me, a restaurant is a restaurant. So in this case, are, is it just not being called a restaurant because of the downtown impact? Uh, because if you remove the downtown from the equation and it's a, it is a restaurant, they are, they are at or are they exceeding the allowed restaurant square meter footage well, that doesn't square meter coverage on the site. Do you follow me on that? Yep. Uh, thanks. I'm I'm able to answer those two questions. So first, with regard to the four meter setback, uh, they did request essentially relief of two meters from the required six meter setback. Um, with this scale of development and with the number of standalone buildings. Uh, and the extent of parking required, it does become difficult to uh, make sure you're appropriately fitting everything on site. Uh, so this this is what has created the relief from that uh, six meter setback. Uh, once you begin um, making alterations, uh, it's a bit of a domino effect in terms of, of losing rows of parking, et cetera. So um, this was one of the, lower impact ways that we could see the um the full build up out of the site with with all of the parking provisions etc that were required uh, and so uh an answer to your second question with regard to the drive through drive through uh restaurants are already permitted on site we did set aside uh the drive through as a separate consideration because uh currently drive through restaurants are not permitted within the downtown and therefore uh, don't necessarily merit consideration in the market impact study as uh, being uses that be to have impact uh, by not locating in the downtown so that's why that uh, provision was set aside so uh, with that set aside the ask is for 520 square meters of a small restaurant which is uh, compared to the permitted 464 square meters of small restaurants. That, Amy. Okay, with that, Councillor Greg. Oh, bear with me, sorry. I think I'm not sure. Thanks, Amy. Yes. Okay, any other questions or comments for Amy? None. I'll call the question. Uh, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Councillor Gregg. In favor. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Councillor Merton. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. Carried. Thank you very much. Wait for Mayor Body to come back in. Where are we going with this? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Larry, for looking after that. Down to uh, 12C, report from City Manager with regard to our uh, actions and decisions. Uh, implemented on COVID-19. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the subject of this report is city actions and decisions implemented on COVID-19 from April 1st to April 27th. 
This is a public health emergency and actions taken regarding city facilities and services during this time. Consider information from our federal and provincial partners and from our local health authorities. The regular communication from those authorities during this crisis has been very helpful to city administration. This report highlights some of the actions taken from April 1st to the 27th by the city of Owen Sound. These actions included on Friday, April 3rd, closing city boat launches. On Monday, April 16th, all city benches, including on trails, were closed to public use. On Tuesday, April 14th, temporary staff layoff notices were provided to approximately 47 employees. Seasonal staff and summer students will not be recalled at this time. Wednesday, April 22nd, we held our first emergency operations center meeting with the control group. Certainly during this roughly three week interval, your worship, many things have been going on. I'll cover just a few here. Uh, myself and the clerk signed an agreement with the Grave Ruth Regional Health Center for a field hospital that I believe is now functional. Community services staff continue to monitor changes to provincial regulations on building permits, inspections, and planning processes that impact our community. Corporate services staff in tax and utility billing are consulting with a large number of residents to ad address unique circumstances and options that are available to them. Our parks and public works staff are installing signage at many city facilities informing the public of their closure and regularly monitoring those facilities. Working closely with Gray County and other lower tiers, Community Development Marketing Manager is keeping updated on emerging programs and initiatives to assist our local businesses during the crisis and during recovery. There will be noticeable reduced levels of service to city residents for the duration of this crisis. Although still open to the public, maintenance at city parks will be lessened. Beautification projects throughout the city will be cut back. Responses to road and sidewalk maintenance requests will take longer and depending on their priority, some may not be completed in 2020. Non-vital or time-sensitive capital projects may be deferred in 2022. That's your worship. Those are the main actions over the last three weeks. I'm certainly open to any discussion council may have. Thank you. Thank you. I've got one of you guys to uh, move it. Councillor Thomas is uh, moving it, so it's now on the uh, floor. Questions from anybody? I have a question. Sorry. John, John has a question. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Wayne, I'm wondering just in general, and thanks for all your hard work, obviously. Uh, we received as council an email from somebody today about a community garden and, and restrictions and so forth. I'm not asking about that specific thing. Uh, be, uh, we were told that that was a provincial decision, what you could do in a community garden and so forth. But can you give us a general idea, uh, Mr. Ritchie, of, of your discretion as a city when it comes to opening and closing things? versus Queens Park. Is there a bright line that you do have some discretion for or is most of it generated from Queens Park? I think the public might benefit from just a bit of information that way. Uh, certainly through your worship. Um, I, I think there are some pretty hard lines, Councillor. Having having said that, as, as we have done right from the beginning for seven weeks now, we have tried uh, to have our staff listening to the announcements from the provincial and federal governments on what we can do, but more specifically, what is not allowed on these, first of all, starting with the essential services list. I can tell all of the public, if in doubt whether you're on the essential service, call the hotline. I have called them several times myself to ask and, and always got, I'm gonna be honest, pretty straightforward, easy to understand answer. I think speaking for the city generally, and I, I think I can speak for the city, this is a health crisis. We're not health experts. We're trying to decipher that and if in any doubt, the safety of our staff, our employees, the public in general, I have no qualms about saying, quite frankly, we will take the conservative step and stay closed. But um, certainly we, we realize the importance of people enjoying our facilities, but um, we are very much listening to those people in the know. And when it comes to a health crisis, no one at City Hall. Okay, anyone else? Seeing anyone else, I will therefore uh, call the question, which is uh, receiving the approving. Don't have in front of me at the report. Um, so, Councillor Dodd, in favor. Councillor Gregg, 
In favor. Mr. Hamley. In favor. Mr. Kepke. In favor. Mr. Merton. In favor. Mr. Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Uh, Councillor Thomas. In favor. So that's carried. So that was 12C. We're down to 12D, which I think is uh, coming from uh, Ms. Allen being the 2019 year end operating and capital report. Thank you, Your Worship. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, normally this report comes through corporate services, so it's a bit uh, wordy and there's a lot of numbers here. Unfortunately, because of weather and some canceled meetings, we did not bring it to corporate services. So it's also coming a bit later than it um, was originally anticipated. The 2019, uh, I guess I'll point out too, there is one recommendation here, and that is that Council approves all transfers to and from reserves as presented. One of the appendixes to this report is our reserve transfers, and this resolution is required as part of our year end audit. The 2019 net budget, net deficit before unbudgeted reserves transfers is approximately $230,000. On a total operating budget of 28 million, this is a variance of 0.8%. The deficit is broken down between operating and capital revenue as follows. Firstly, the report summarizes um, the surplus and deficit by major division. I hope that the copy that you're looking at has the color coding, um, but for your reference, numbers that appear positive are in red, and those are actually negative variances. The other items that are negative are in blue and those are positive variances. And that just shows the summary by department down to the 230,000. In order to bring the deficit to zero and to ensure stabilized budgeting, it is recommended that the amount be transferred from the tax stability reserve. And I'll note that in 2018, we did have a surplus which was put into that reserve. So this is sort of an example of how we can use that reserve to even out those ups and downs. There are four major drivers resulting in the deficit. The first thing is a major assessment review board decision resulting in 1.7 million in tax revenue write offs, which the city had accrued 700,000. The 900,000 difference drives our deficit and without it, we would be in a surplus position. In late 2018, council received an assessment at risk report that estimated the future tax write off in this range. And an updated report estimates that future revenues at risk for the period ending December 31st, 2019 and 2020 are a deemed risk of 1.5 million. Our 2028 budget was adjusted to increase to 350 in order to help offset those future expected cash flows. Offsetting um, that downward pressure is unbudgeted OMPF funding. We got our 2019 OMPF notices late, and as such, we had that unbudgeted increase of 265,000, which we're able to use to offset the deficit from the tax write-off. Wage gapping is our third major driver and is in the good. $1.1 million in savings is a result of uh, positions that were vacant for either a portion or all of the year. And then there's just a quick summary in the document itself of what the total wage budgets are for major departments and what their surplus was, as well as the variance based on budget. I will note that the Tom Thompson wage gapping room is proposed to increase the transfer to the prior year deficits. And in fact, we are proposing that we are going to apply almost double the annual contribution to reduce that deficit at the art gallery. And hopefully we can stop making that contribution sooner than later. And finally, weather. Weather has always had an impact on annual operating budget variances. Wet weather in the spring and the fall impacts user fees, leachate hauling costs at the landfill, and other maintenance activities. Cold winters result in higher costs for salt and sand, overtime for winter control activities, and third party snow removal. Winter control activities in 2019 were $330,000 over budget, and landfill monitoring was an additional $45,000. Other variances in corporate expenses are the following. Um, approximately 92% of the corporation's total training budget of $235,000 was utilized. And I'll just sort of, as a tip, promote that this is one of the budget items that my next report suggests may be used to offset the COVID-related costs. The 
total variance in electricity costs was less than a percent, $9,000 on a budget of 1.8 million. Small variances in heating and water. Corporately, we overspent our legal fees. Higher than budgeted legal fees were driven by arbitration expenses associated with union agreements and an expropriation settlement. Insurance expense is right on budget. Our annual insurance expense is approximately 800,000. Nearly 300,000 for corporate building maintenance was fully utilized in 2019. And fleet costs, including maintenance, fuel, and parts were over budget by about 13.5%. Attached to this report is a summary of operating variances by division. Within capital, the 2019 capital budget anticipated taxation source funding of $2.275 million. The actual tax funding required was just under 40,000 below that, and the surplus created or that $40,000 is proposed to be added to the capital reserve. Also included in this report is a summary of the city hall renovation. The renovation project began on March 20th, 2017 with an anticipated construction duration of one year. Delays occurred affecting the completion date and city staff relocated back to city hall on November 12th, 2018. Highlights of the renovation project included complete removal of all building systems, including plumbing, electrical and mechanical, repairs and restoration of the exterior, removal of interior finishes, efficient design and layout of offices, workstations, meeting rooms, and public spaces. Ultimately, this project, although delayed, came in under budget. The report then summarizes the financial position of our two rate funded departments at year end being water and wastewater services. The closing reserves in water is 2.8 million and closing reserves in wastewater 800,000. And I'll point out that these funds are committed to future capital projects over the next uh, two to three years. The net general deficit is recommended to be covered by the discretionary stabilization reserve. And I believe this is appropriate given the purpose of that reserve to be used to offset one time spikes in budgeted spending or future tax write offs that exceed the amount accrued and budgeted. And then finally, as a communication strategy, future financial reports will be provided to Council and we have another one coming this evening. I'm just going to address the appendices to this report um, to highlight what they are, but I won't go through them in great detail. The first item is a summary of variances by division, and there is notes on the final in the last column to explain what the variances are driven by. The next item, and, and this is the one that relates to the recommendation in the report, is a summary of all of the city's reserves budgeted transfers and then the highlighted column are any transfers that were not that were recommended but were not included in the budget and then a description of what that transfer relates to and the re recommendation tonight is for council to approve those items next we have our capital program for 2019 i'll note that the year to date column is color coded uh, items showing up in pink or were either unbudgeted or slightly overspent and in green they were under budget I'll remind Council that in total tax funded capital was under budget by $40,000 and that that amount is recommended to be put in the capital reserve. I believe at the end of 2019 that capital reserve will have about $250,000 in it. Following this summary of the 2019 capital progress is the detailed breakdown of the city hall capital project. All said and done, we believe that that project is about $90,000 under budget. Um, that being said, there may be some uh, outstanding legal invoices that have yet to be applied, but they will not be significant. We are moving forward with that debenture in 2020, as Council will recall, has been approved to apply in the last meeting. The next summary is our unfinanced capital, $23 million at the end of 2019. Many of these projects are funded to be or complete to be funded in the 2020 budget and also the venture projects here, including the Harrison Park Electrical, the City Hall renovation, and moving forward with the Regional Recreation Center to venture. And finally, just for Council's interest, is a list of all outstanding loan balances at the end of the year. 
Our total debt to external sources is 21.7 million and our annual debt payments, principal and interest are just over $4 million. There's a lot of information there. I'll assume that you've had some time before this meeting to review it and I'm open to any questions. Get somebody to uh, move it. Councillor Thomas is moving it. And uh, we'll go back. The recommendation is to receive the report and approve all transfers to and from reserves as uh, presented in the report. So, Council, questions? Anybody? Councillor Greg here. Okay. Uh, question to Mr. Kafalis. It's been about five years since we had a, a full summer, a thorough look at uh, winter control and with that variance coming off of last year which while it wasn't as uh, gentle as this the spring has been it also wasn't the winter of 13 14 where we had absolutely ran out of snow and it was minus 18 by december 4th and stayed that way for for 16 weeks i'm just wondering with the variance of that size if having a report come back to committee in the next you know five six months leading into 2021 is something that we could consider it's it's um it's just been five years so alice are you out there uh thank you for the question um it's something we definitely can provide as a report um i think the biggest change over those years i guess seven years or or five to seven years is the minimum maintenance standards that we must follow now. But it does have a significant impact on the level of service that we have to provide, but we can put together a report indicating the uh, difference in services over the years and what we must uh, do to adhere to the minimum maintenance standards. Councilor Craig, back to you. Nothing. Thanks. I've got uh, some video that's uh, going in and out. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, Perhaps it would be valuable then to us as counselors to become more aware of when the province is looking to update or change these minimum maintenance standards. What's good in Toronto or what's good in Burlington or Ottawa is entirely different than what's good in Saugeen Shores or Owen Sound or Midland. Um, I don't know what the input process is for considerations on changes, but um, this could be one where we're getting hammered pretty good at, uh, at the, you know, some municipalities just don't um, take it as much in the chin as we do. So it might be nice then for us to be more aware of what, when they're considering these changes, what are we talking about? Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, Councillor Tamming here. Kate, thank you very much for this. A lot of hard work and very interesting to read. Uh, I've been waiting for those reassessments uh, with a lot of um, trepidation. Do you think we're through the worst of that, uh, Kate, in terms of the process? Are we, are, we, are we through the worst of it? No, I don't think we're through the worst of it. I think these adjustments to commercial assessment will continue. That being said, I think as far as single um, decisions go on single properties that that one was one that we were waiting for and they won't be sort of one time hits quite like that but i do expect that we'll see adjusted assessment impacting our write offs for many years to come if that is even worse after this year anyone else okay i'm not seeing anyone else uh, moving so i will call the question for approval that uh Recommendation or those uh, that motion, Councillor Dodd. Thank you, Worship. In favor. Mr. Greg. You can't see me, but I'm in favor. Yeah. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Merton. In favor. Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. So that is carried. That was 12D down to uh, 12E, which is, uh, I think it's you again, Kate. Nope, nope, nope. It's a wayfinding sign. Pam. Thank you, Worship. As part of your budget, um, 
Council had supported a wayfinding project. The project really does support the direction of our official plan and will improve uh, visitors and residents' first impressions. At budget, we had endeavored to bring you a detailed report on the initiative. As per the report, we're recommending we adopt the RT07 signage standards. I don't think there's any point in reinventing the wheel. It's a tried and true standard. I would ask the clerk to go to the illustration um, in the attachments. The layout, design, placement, and accessibility are all set out in the standard. We're going to use the uh, VU1. The report mentions VH1. It should say VU1, which is urban directional. Um, using this standard also opens up opportunities in the future to receive funding through RTO7. This year's project is in part funded through the uh, Provincial Red Program. I would ask the clerk now to go to the map, which is the last page of the report. We're proposing 26 locations within the city. These locations were selected based on traffic numbers, decision points where travelers are making a decision about going downtown or, or going somewhere else. Um, they allow four lines of text. So with that, your worship, the recommendation in the report is that City Council would direct staff to proceed with preparing and issuing the RFP to include the and to include the locations as outlined in the report in accordance with our procurement bylaw. Thank you. Where are you moving that? I'll move that, Your Worship. Questions from Council? Councillor Greg here. Go ahead. Thank you for preparing the report, Pam. It's something I asked for at budget. I wasn't in support of this expenditure at budget. Um, there's a couple things that are interesting to note coming out of that. One of which is, and you mentioned it, is the the traffic statistics in the appendix at the back. And it's interesting the percentage decline in vehicles counted on 10th Street in particular moving through the city. There's a lot of uh, negative 10s, 12s, 13s decline in 10 years. Um, I know we're going to get into a report right shortly where we're looking at capital deferrals for this year due to this, the instance that we're in right now in the deficit. Uh, this is one here where personally, if we can put off, I think we had an, uh, an expenditure that was very much the same as this $90,000 for painting fire hydrants. If something like that can be put off, uh, this is one here where I'm also in favor of council uh, putting this one off on deferral till 2021. I feel like half the year is gone right now. We've got a small grant for it, but um, this for the next four months is more of a keep somebody busy uh, project. I know we're getting we're preparing for 21, but uh, in light of the financial stress we've got right now, I, I personally for one is. Uh, in favor of putting this off. Also, there's a, there's, there's a sign where it's noted to mark direction to Nichols Gully. Uh, there's 26 locations, $90,000, so it's $3,800 maybe, thereabouts, every sign. Something like a Nichols Gully, um, we don't have money to spare, so is there spots that we can even cut back on this type of signage? Any uh, any answers to those? Certainly, Your Worship. If if Council's wish is that we look at that Nichols Gully sign, if if the um, I'm not sure what else. There's usually about four nodes on or po points on each sign, so um, we can certainly look at that one. I'm just saying you're already exiting Owen Sound at that point. If you're going to see it, uh, so it's it's not particularly relevant. Uh, some of these remind me when you're coming into Owen Sound from Spring Mount, um, you're almost, you're working your way down the hill towards Peninsula Ford. The sign says Owen Sound in five kilometers. 
if it's taking you five kilometers to get to Owen Sound from that point, you're a horrible driver. Um, so sometimes these signs, I, I question why they're put up in the first place. They measure to the, uh, to the uh, post office, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Councillor Merton has got a comment. Go ahead. Through your worship, there was mention of a grant. And I'm wondering if if we did not proceed this budget year, does that grant still carry over for future budget years? In other words, do we keep the grant or lose the grant? Ma'am, did you get that question? Thank you, Worship. Just just checking here. Um, we did. We were successful in receiving the grant. I'm not sure um, if we don't do the project this year. I would have to get back to council on whether the grant could be carried over. Little Wayne, he may have an answer. I, I think it carries over, but we can certainly confirm that. I and I don't want to cut off the debate on on this issue, but I strongly suggest this is only a capital project that happened to be coming forward tonight for approval. What I want to say to Council is your staff here in the coming, hopefully no more than the next few weeks, but as long as this goes on, what we're giving you in Kate's report when it comes up are the capital that we've discussed to say we could, as we see how this is, is working out, not do some of these. I hate to say that unfortunately this was the one came forward tonight and we didn't do unless Council feels we just don't want to do this project, but the record is Listen to Kate's report, we look at it in, in the broader picture and say, yes, there's nothing in there, quite frankly, the council says we approve that in the 2020 budget and we want it done. And rely on your staff moving ahead to understand the, the financial hole we're facing and keep reflecting back on that capital budget to say, maybe we don't do this one. But I'd, I'd hate to see a decision made tonight just because by pure bad, Bad chance that was the project that was put forward, but that almost suggesting that we should sort of hold on it till we see some of the others that are coming forward. It, 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 would that make sense? That that probably, in my opinion, your worship would make more sense than just getting rid of this one tonight because it was first up. Yes. Okay. So there, there's another thought. Councillor Thomas had his hand up. Well, I think that uh, you know I wouldn't support. Uh, getting rid of this project in any case. Uh, wayfinding signs have been a critical issue in Owen Sound for many years. I think back to uh, the study that was done, the co-study with the city of Aurelia, I think it's at least 10 or 12 years ago. And one of the key findings of that study from the group from Aurelia was, it was very difficult to find your way around Owen Sound because the signage was not great. And I think that uh, we've waited a long time to have this project come forward. And, uh, you know, personally, I like to look at it as kind of an optimistic project because uh, it indicates to me that people are going to come back to Owen Sound someday. Uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you. I would echo Councillor Thomas's uh, point. No, I don't. Uh, I think we're leaders in the community. We, we're in a situation right now. We, we certainly don't want to be pushing the big red button and start making changes. Let's just stay the course, keep going. We have no idea what the government's going to do when this is all said and done. Um, if we have good things coming our way like this, we should just keep going. It's, you know, just to pick another one, flowers in our downtown. I will do everything I can to make sure we have flowers in our downtown. Why would we stop something to, to pick people up or to help in the mental health side of this? Like the last thing we need to be doing as a council is start pushing the red button and making changes to what we've already decided to. Let's just stay the course and, and we'll assess the damage when this is all said and done. Those are my comments. Your worship. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, through your worship, in terms of the, the red grant, um, I just want to point out part of the criteria of that grant was connecting community to community. So that's the reason for the, uh, the note at Nichols Gully um, pointing people in that direction. So part of the grant criteria was that connectivity between communities. Thank you. So any other councillors wish to speak to this that haven't yet? 
And so I'm going to uh, call the question, which is to uh, proceed with preparing and issuing a request for proposal to include locations outlined in the uh, report. So, um, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Councillor Gregg. Opposed. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Councillor Merton. In favor. Uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. So that carries. That was 12B. Thanks, Pam. Uh, 12F. Now we're back to Kate with regard to the financial forecast from uh, COVID. Thank you, Your Worship. Normally, this time of year, I would be bringing forward a first quarter financial update uh, for the first three months of the year. Um, actually, it would probably be another month as we don't fully have all of that information up to the end of March just yet, but there is some pressure to understand now what the cost of some of the impacts related to our COVID changes are. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the province of Ontario issued a state of emergency on March 17th. Following that, on March 23rd, the government ordered all non-essential businesses to close. They've issued orders prohibiting all organized public events, over five people. The government has ordered the closure of all outdoor recreational facilities, and this state of emergency has been extended. I believe it's currently to May 12th, although that might have changed since I wrote this report as well. Consistent with the provincial declaration, the city has also issued a state of emergency on March 27th. In response to the changing situation, the City of Owen Sound has also implemented many changes, including the closing of city facilities to the public, deploying staff in teams to reduce exposure, closing all recreational amenities, including playgrounds and park benches, implementing work from home initiatives, waiving penalty and interest on all amounts owing to the city, including tax and water accounts, and not enforcing payment for transit, bag tags, or parking. In an effort to offset lost revenues and focus on essential services, in April, many staff have received layoff notices and that will go into effect on May 12th. The notice period is in line with language in the city's collective agreements. These are just some of the factors that will have a significant impact on the city's financial position in 2020. As part of the analysis, staff have reviewed each department and estimated what the financial impact of COVID related changes, as well as other factors that are known to date that will affect the year end financial position are. Before any changes to the capital program, I'm estimating that roughly $1 million in operating deficit is potential um, due to mostly reduced user fees and other revenues. I'd like to highlight that that's a conservative forecast. Um, we're not proposing any changes to the budget. Um, this is just a forecast of what could potentially vary from our budget. The estimate relies on assumptions and variables um, there are certainly differing opinions as to the duration and the impact. Admittedly, my own outlook changes sometimes by the minute. For the purposes of this report, I've assumed we, that we return to what I'm calling a new normal July 1st. However, in many cases, my estimates have had persisted impact throughout the summer. I'll also just jump to the end to highlight that at, time, at the time of writing this report, and as I present it tonight, I believe that with the planned efforts considered, the city is well positioned to weather the COVID impacts financially. And as timelines become more clear, this report will be updated and presented to council on a regular basis. There are in the background of an analysis of the report, there is a summary of many different areas that are impacted by COVID. I'm gonna highlight four major ones. Um, the first one has to do with taxes and interest. The city has currently committed to waiving penalty and interest on all amounts owing to the city, including taxes, water and wastewater bills, as well as general accounts receivable for the period of April, May and June. That is likely to continue on. We are bringing forward our final tax bylaw in May. And at that point, council may consider some other short term tax relief. Options from any of the um, group meetings that I've been to through AMO through AMCTO. Most municipalities are working on these short term relief efforts for now. 
it's a little too early to consider what those long term programs might look like in order to provide relief to the taxpayer. And it's my recommendation that we wait till we're closer to the known end of the pandemic. And we have a bit more direction from our higher levels of government, as well as some idea consistently what municipalities in our neighboring area are doing. Um, and that is certainly the feeling that I'm seeing in other municipalities as well. That being said, there is a cost to waiving penalties and interest, and I'm estimating up to $180,000 of our revenue may be lost because of that. Also, when you delay payments, we delay cash flow, despite that our expenses are often even throughout the year, and create this gap between uh, cash coming in and going out. And as a result, I do expect that we will have to utilize the line of credit that we have created an agreement with RBC, and that will increase our interest expense. So between waiving those penalties and interest and gapping the time between those revenues and expenses, I'm estimating approximately $300,000. The other major item sort of causing a um, downward pressure on our revenues is user fees. Everything from waste management, so our bag tags, our transit user fees, program and facility booking, as well as campground registrations. These are all significant sources of revenue that the city uses to offset the total tax levy. Um, those services, in many cases, not all are continuing. For example, we're still continuing to collect garbage. We're still continuing to provide transit. Those costs are still there. Those revenues are not coming in to offset it. So that will create lost revenues and, and there is a cost to that. Offsetting those costs are potential wage, wages um, saved through the layoffs as well as gapping. And I would say the gapping is more significant in that there are many vacant positions that we are holding back on fill in until this is over. And I'm estimating approximately $750,000 in savings from those wage gapping and uh, layoffs. And as well, this report includes some potential options for amendments to the capital budget. I'll just jump ahead to where those projects are listed. Staff have reviewed the capital budget and identified any projects that could potentially be deferred, mostly because we're not committed to them. They haven't been started yet and their funding source could potentially be used to offset COVID. I would say to Council, we're not suggesting tonight that we approve removing all of these items from the budget and certainly rely on staff to continue monitoring the situation and our resources. Certainly financial resources are not our only resources. Staff time is required in order to undertake these projects as well. And I've just highlighted that we intend to save close to three quarters of a million dollars by reducing our total staff complement either temporarily or until year end. The other thing to keep in mind with these capital projects in total, the list here is just over $600,000 in capital. However, if we defer those projects and we utilize those funds, um, each one of those projects will have to be rebudgeted for in 2021 if you want to go through with it, which will in effect eat away at the available funding that you have for our already planned 2021 capital projects. So there's give and take, and certainly I expect staff will be monitoring the situation carefully as we look at how we prioritize capital going forward. So I'll jump to, there's two appendices. The first one is a summary of the ups and downs um, that I used to come up with. I wouldn't get too pissed on the dollars and cents, and certainly I would have rounded those if I could have figured out how to do that quickly in my Excel document. But it does give you an idea in the comments of some of the pressures that we have in each of those line items. And then finally, there is our full 2020 capital budget. There is a new column added here called COVID, and there was some confusion, I think, because there were some columns that said, or some projects that said yes, but they weren't highlighted in blue. So the yes is where staff have gone through and said, we haven't started this project yet. This is a potential project that can be deferred. The blue are the items that we reviewed as senior management and with our department heads and said, these are the projects that we will bring forward to council so that you have an understanding of those sorts of projects that may be deferred into an, in which case we'll have to relook at them again in future years. So with that, this is an information report and I'll look forward to providing more information um, on a regular basis to council as we have a better idea of our timelines. Council. 
just actually, we should put that report in the floor. Uh, Councillor Deputy Mayor Larry, are you moving that? I'd be happy to move that. So now it's on the floor. So comments, questions from Council, please go ahead. Councillor Dodd, I see your hand moving. Your Worship, uh, just just a quick question uh, back to Miss Allen regarding um, some of the capital projects that are going to be continuing, hopefully continuing for the 2020 year. Um, could we just have a general understanding on, um, I'm not sure exactly what uh, has been implemented by the province regarding uh, asphalt road resurfacing. Would those projects still be continuing or do those classify as an essential service um, for some of our roadways? I'll defer that uh, to our director of operations and uh, engineering, if that's all right, Dennis. Absolutely, thank you for the question, Councillor Dodd. Uh, those uh, roadways are considered, um, I guess, the ongoing projects in terms of uh, what's considered essential roadways is one of them. Um, this, uh, we did put that forward as uh, we thought originally that we could help uh, Miss Allen out with trying to help find sources to help uh, reduce the overall deficit that might be generated by COVID-19. Um, this is a project that's really coming down now to uh, resources internally in terms of who can actually carry out the project. So, for instance, if we end up in this, I don't want to call it a lockdown, but uh, where we have the reduced staff and it lasts longer, say, and you know, goes into September or whatever, uh, the chances of getting that project done are, are very slim. Uh, if we come out of that in July, like July 1st, like uh, trying to be optimistic here, then uh, the chances are we, we can get that project done. So right now it's a, it's maybe a coin flip and it all depends on how quickly we can get back to uh, full resources and, and get the tender out and, and get it implemented. Because the uh, contractors, our feeling is that a lot of these contractors are gonna be eager to go and, and, and get the, and eager to bid on any sort of tenders that we come out with uh, any time this summer. I hope I answered that question. Thank, thank you, Dennis, you, you did you, and I appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I would just like to make sure, um, and I, I'd be very vocal on this again, like I was in, in budget, um, we have some failed roads within our city. Um, and I would really hope that if any capital projects are being deferred, um, I would hope that we would be um, fulfilling uh, our duty of repairing those failed roadways. And whether that means putting a little bit of a, a um, putting those forward. Um, once things do move forward, uh, when we get back to um, normal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tamming. Yes, Kate, thank you again for, um, for this detail. Just a, a few things, I just, uh, just wanna hit them. First of all, is it possible, Kate, that we get a monthly update, a monthly COVID variance report, at least on the operating side? Is that a possibility? Because you're trying, and I can see this, you're trying to nail jello to the wall, basically. And, and it's very difficult to do that. On the other hand, it, it'd be a shame if certain things got away from us, say missed interest charges and so forth. And I'm just wondering if you could do a monthly update and perhaps compare that to the month previous of last year to track how we're doing. It's, it's a bit of a metric and that's all. I just wonder if that would be a lot of extra work to ask of you. Well, that's no problem. That would be my intention. Okay to present to us too then, right, uh, Ms. Allen? Okay, terrific. The second question I emailed you earlier today about this was the library. I notice it's not mentioned. There's a reason for that. It's sort of a different corporate setup, but library layoffs have happened. The library, I understand, is closed, and that does have an impact, a positive impact, I suspect, on our levy as well. Do you have any idea of how much savings that represents from our budget or in terms of library? I don't have any indication as of right now as to um, the library's financial position, but I would recommend that council request that from the library board. And I can certainly work with Tim to ensure that I have something included in my next presentation. I would welcome that. I think it's just consistent. We're getting that from all other uh, sources and so forth. Uh, also, police and fire just represent about 50. What are we at now? About 47% of our budget, police and fire. Is that correct? So. Sorry, I think you're muted there, Ms. Allen. Yes, sorry. And uh, just for the record, they, they have not come to us with any suggestions about how they too could participate in cost savings. I'm not being facetious, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that. Have they come to us and said, how can we? Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think you were cutting out there. Um, 
at our daily roundtable, I did discuss with both our fire chief and our police chief that I was working on this report. Um, that being said, I was really focusing on what our financial forecast is as a result of COVID. And although we do anticipate that there will be variances um, as we have every year in police and fire services from budget, both chiefs confirmed that they are business as usual and therefore I didn't anticipate any COVID related variances and I'll look to them for future um, estimated variances just as part of their regular um, financial reports in the coming weeks. No sharing of the COVID pain from either of those departments. Is that a fair summary? So far, so good. Um, and even in the city, our materials and extra costs specifically related to the pandemic have not been um, significant. Um, over time, certainly something that police and fire will want to keep an eye on as well, though. Uh, next, just real quick, and I appreciate your worship, just a couple more. Bag tags, was that a provincial decision to waive bag tags similar to um, the interest charges and so forth, or was that a municipal? Is that our decision? To clarify, the penalty and interest is not a provincial decision. It's a commonly utilized uh, relief effort throughout the province, but we have not received any direction that it is a requirement. Um, similar with bag tags, I think we are seeing that many municipalities are applying this um, number of bag tags, tags, or if you don't have bag tags, we'll still take your garbage. But I don't believe there's a provincial legislation or a mandate to do so. And that alone, bag tags is costing us about 33,000 a month. Is that correct? That's our, that's our estimate, yes. So would you, if, if a counselor wanted to uh, take a second look at that, would that have to happen by way of motion at our next meeting or how would that take place? I, I, think, I think we need to really think why we're giving um, free garbage service at this point in time. Transit, I can understand fully, uh, but the bag tags, I don't understand why we suspended that. So would that be a motion that would be necessary to have your department reconsider that? I believe Brianna can confirm, but I believe through um, the city manager's COVID update reports, council has uh, moved that decision to waive those fees. So if you wanted to um, reapply them or start charging them again, I do believe you'd need a motion. I can't see Brianna. I thank you and I thank fellow councillors for your indulgence. I'm going to uh, go to Mr. Ritchie first. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and absolutely, councillor, I, I think, uh, again, watching what the best advice was at that time when we waived the bag tag fees, we didn't want anyone going out specifically just to buy a bag tag. I think that is something that we, uh, certainly council should review, specifically bag tag. And uh, I think uh, we will listen to more information in the next week. And that very well may be a report you see council on the 11th with a suggestion, if everything seems to be where it is, that people are, go are going out I know that we have our bag tags out there and all the retail outlets they normally were. Uh, part of this as well is that our retailers are, are open and able to sell the bag tags. So absolutely this, this will be back on the table. I would be uh, hoping you have a report on the 11th to maybe reconsider that bag tag issue. Mary, did I see your hand waving around? Here, you might want to uh, hit your mic. Okay, is that better? I can hear you now. Okay, um, yes, my comments were the same as the city manager. I think of, of retail locations that are selling bag tags are just not there for people to utilize. And we don't want to encourage people to go out just for a bag tag. We, um, when things settle down, that will resume as normal. But now I think it's essential. Anyone else? Other councillors? Wave your hand. I can't see everybody. Councillor Greg, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Your Worship. Uh, I'm kind of on side with you there. Uh, my question further to that is if there's a time lapse, council never specifically gave direction initially to waive the bag tags. Yes, we may have ratified that as part of a larger report after, but why would council's direction then be required to reinstate it? Why could the city manager not do that uh, when he sees it fit the stores have reopened? I, that doesn't make sense to me. There's a disconnect. Because we've ratified it as you've stated. Yeah, 
it, he canceled bag tags without us giving direction on it. We've approved that, so it's now a council decision, so it's up to council to undo it. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, I have, a few months ago, we, we tasked the city manager with a monumental task of meeting UN emissions targets. And while we changed our course a little bit, we didn't exactly change the monumental task that we delivered the city manager to carry out. Uh, in every challenge lays two opportunities. You can, you have the opportunity to make the right decision and the opportunity to make the wrong decision. Um, I'm wondering if this isn't something here where council can look at the fuel savings that we're accumulating right now, because if you want to buy oil, the producers are ready to sell you a barrel of it cheap. So. Uh, it will be significant, and I'm wondering if maybe a reserve or consideration is appropriate to look at starting to fund uh, a transition in some of our fleet or uh, probably fleet vehicles is, is where you'd start in terms of achieving some of those targets that we um, we we kind of task the city to achieving. I'm trying to figure out how that applies to the report and then whether it was a question or just a statement or. Well, if we're getting future reports every month, perhaps fuel savings bec achieved because of the, de the decline in the, the price is something that we can add to that report and council can consider what we do with those savings. Kate, are you there? I can certainly um, report to council how our fuel expenses compare to the same period last year. And it's bound to change from what we budgeted, I think, is what uh, Scott's saying with the uh, drop of the oil price. So that's that's something you're going to be tracking anyway. Thanks. Okay. Any other councillors uh, have anything to say? And it hasn't spoken. Carol, I don't have you on my screen in front of me. So is there anything you want to speak to? Thank you, Mayor Body. Yes. First of all, I want to thank the staff for going through the exercise of all of the suggestions. It's never an easy job to do. I have just a couple of questions. This was the first swipe at potential opportunities for savings related to COVID. Is there a plan to do a deeper dive? recognizing that this may potentially be a conservative estimate. I noticed in the report that there are a few sections that perhaps could be looked at again, sections that haven't been touched on. Um, you know, the council section, um, you know, there's been different references. Is there a plan to do a deeper dive? Your Worship, absolutely, as we have a better idea of um, what the return to new normal might look like, uh, we'll be updating this. And as we have our actual um, revenues coming in and expenditures coming in, we'll certainly be able to refine those numbers. So as I come back to Council a month from now, or maybe even before that, um, we'll certainly refine everything we can. So. Thank you. My second question has to do about the difference between presenting information and a motion to um, move forward with decisions. So there's been some suggestion about capital projects that should be deferred. Um, when we approve this as a council, it's often on a priority scale. There's, I need to know the impact of deferring some of the capital projects based on the fact that often we approve because they were very high or high priority. And then based on that, I would also appreciate a recovery strategy plan. In other words, as we evolve through post COVID, is there, are there stages where the capital projects might be able to be reintroduced? I just need clarification about this. I will highlight that if we cancel or I should say defer these capital projects and utilize their funding in order to offset an operating deficit, 
um, the most significant impact will be that those projects need to be rebudgeted for if we are to undertake them. I could. It opens up. Sorry. I think I need to point out to to council, but also to the public, and and it's just these are just facts. But it was mentioned earlier: forty six percent of our operating budget is devoted to police and fire. They are still operating normal service. So. That's that's not available to, <clears throat> to find reduction. We have, you know, very difficult decision. We have temporarily laid off 47 staff members outside of police and fire, people that people that do the frontline work for this community. There's only so much we can do and still actually provide any service to the community. <clears throat> I have to tell you, I think we're very close to that point now. So if if you're thinking more deep cuts, more deep dives. I don't know exactly where we would dive and still provide any service to the community. So um, I think what we need to do, we need to obviously always keep watching what we're doing. We're doing that. We do that daily. We meet every day at nine o'clock. Any suggestions, we're open to them. We need to, as Councilor O'Leary said, I think we need to ride this out, be as prudent as we can be, putting safety first, Finance is certainly second, but they're important to us. At the end, like almost every community in North America, we'll finally see what the results are to the community, also financially, and we will work our way out of it. But to try to sit now, not knowing where this ends, saying what more could we do, we'll, we'll always, every day, be looking for more. But I think the community needs to be aware. We're providing minimum service, essential services, and there's not a whole lot more that we can do. Um, that's not for me, Your Worship. You don't want anything to add? I appreciate the response, and I, I certainly appreciate continuing the analysis. Uh, I think it's important um, that opportunities may present themselves, but I, I certainly appreciate the fact that it's top of the radar. Councillor Hamley, you're the other one that I don't see on the screen. Did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, yeah I had one on uh, community development events and tourism. Uh, it, the report notes canceled events through June, uh, the home show, doors open, and Riverside reunion. Um, and it's noted that that's saved us fifteen thousand dollars. I'm I'm a little bit surprised that it's it's only fifteen thousand um, dollars. Are, are we locked in on contracts for those things? I can help. My recollection is we actually make money at doors open. So I think the net of that may be how we've arrived at the fifteen. Councillor Kate, would that be fair? It's the home show. Actually, is actually a revenue generator. Yeah. Um, so without those revenues canceling that event actually has a cost to the city. Okay. Yeah. Um, and moving forward, the future events, how are we making decisions on that? Cause you know, I don't want to get locked into contracts that we sign now, if we're not going to be using them. I'll defer that to uh, Pam, if that's okay. Thank you, worship. Uh, Staff in community development and marketing have developed a matrix for each of our events with dates. And what we have done is try to do event planning without locking ourselves into contract. We know what dates are, which is our last date to cancel things by so that there isn't a penalty to, to the booking of certain things. So we're monitoring that. Um, as Mr. Ritchie mentioned, we're taking direction from the province. We watched uh, Mr. Ford, today we're taking direction from our local medical officer of health and just monitoring things to see um, what, in fact, may be possible um, to help this community as we recover, hopefully later this summer. Back to Councillor uh, Hamley. Yeah, no, thank you. That was that was it. I'm I'm wondering. I'm thinking about Canada Day coming pretty quickly. I'm thinking about. Uh, Things that are coming up in July, if we should have some kind of report, no, maybe May 11th isn't going to be. Okay, so you're watching that daily, but I wonder if we can have some. Yeah, 
council, just so we know whether May 11th is too soon or the next meeting after that, but just kind of a report on the plan coming to council so that we know what's yeah, going so on. Pam, I don't know if you can hear us or go ahead. Certainly, Your Worship. So you'd like a report at a future council meeting sort of on those early, uh, like early summer, July type events. I, I would know. We see summer folk, uh, Salmon Spectacular, uh, Wimbledon uh, Folk Festivals right across the uh, province closing for the summer. We're still holding on for uh, July, some of those dates. Looking at what the uh, Premier said today about phasing in with uh, sort of a three days approach, um, you know, two to four weeks, he wasn't tied into exact dates, but two to four weeks for each phase. You know, I think we're well into July or August and before we're ever going to be able to put uh, a large group of people together from the appearance of it. But anyway, if we could just have something maybe in a, in a couple of weeks or in a month, depending. We may not know enough in two weeks to be able to answer. Certainly, we, we can bring that back, Your Worship. I think the next, our next meeting is Monday, the 11th of May. It's my understanding that the provincial 28-day uh, extension goes to May 12th or 13th. 12th. So we might not have an answer on the 11th. It may come out a day later, but anyway, I think we've got information. Marion, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the report recommendation says receiving the report for information. And I wondered, there's recommendations in there about deferring capital projects. Um, so how are we actually acting on those? My intention was to present to council a list of capital projects that staff will potentially um, look at deferring as more information is is no I don't think I'm looking I, I wasn't intending to get direction from Council uh, tonight to make that official as far as any of those projects go that being said it's obviously Council's prerogative to do so if you wish okay thank you councillors wish to speak seeing none we move this already Mayor O'Leary has uh, moved it, so I'm going to uh, take the vote. Councilor Dodd? In favor. Greg? In favor. Mr. Hamley? Mr. Hamley? Didn't hear you. Uh, in favor. Councilor Kepke? In favor. Mr. Burton? In favor. Mayor O'Leary? In Deputy favor. Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councilor Tamming? In favor. Councillor Thomas. In favor. So that's carried. That is a 12 F. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Caton, for all of staff. Because I think you probably had several meetings to uh, fight over that one to try and figure things out as you're going through. So thanks to everybody. Uh, 12 D, community services. Uh, oh, the Surrey uh, Hospital, Pam. Thank you, Your Worship. On March 26, the Assistant Deputy uh, Minister of Health issued a memo regarding the critical need to expand hospital capacity across the province. There was general approval under the Public Hospital Act to op operate and use any institution or building for the purpose of, of, the host of a hospital. One condition of the use is an agreement. The city was contacted by Gary Sims, the President and C. EO of Grey Bruce Health Services on March 30th. Together, uh, hospital staff and city staff did a walkthrough of the Bayshore Community Center on March 31st to determine the suitability of the site for the proposed use. Work has been coordinated between city and Grey Bruce Health Services staff. Hospital staff have undertaken the design, layout, procured the goods and services. Um, work in the facility at the Bayshore Community Centre started on April 2nd and Your Worship, I'm certainly pleased that a 75 bed medical facility complete with x-ray lab, pharmacy, washrooms um, is, is ready if it's needed by, uh, by the public. 
Graber's Health Services staff will do any cleaning and care in the facility. The agreement runs till June 30th as required by the province. Um, the agreement provides a few things uh, for, for the use till June 30th. It provides insurance. Um, it has been reviewed by our insurer. Um, at the end of the use, um, the hospital has seven days to disassemble the, the, the space and then clean and disinfect it ready again for public use. I think it's remarkable that at the end, all of the elements um, that are there on site will be packed up and stored for future use in any, any emergency. Um, I, I just want to take a minute, Your Worship, and I want to thank our facility staff and our IT staff have, who have worked really hard to make this happen, as well as staff, um, uh, Mr. Gary Sims and his staff at Great Bruce Health Services, who have been uh, really terrific to work with. Um, the bylaw to ratify the agreement, Your Worship, was included with the city manager's report due to timing. Uh, Mr. Ritchie had signed the report. Any questions from anyone? I'll move the recommendation, Your Worship. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? It's my understanding from Dr. Era that there's a not to the same degree, but there's a uh, hospital facility set up uh, in, uh, I think, Hanover and in Concordon. There's also a recovery center that we were setting up in a gym in uh, Hanover. This one came together very quickly from oxygen to suction to uh, the piping that went through it. And it is uh, pretty impressive to, uh, to see it what's come together in our community. If we ever got to those numbers that we needed an overflow, the hospital, we've got uh, the ability to treat people beyond what the uh, regular capacity would be, and um, pretty important uh, in these times. It was very impressive. So I'm going to call the question, unless anyone else has comments. None. Councillor uh, Dodd? In favor. Councillor Greg? In favor. Councillor Hamley? In favor. Kepke? In favor. Merton? In favor. Uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. Thank you. So thanks, Pam, for the report. That's uh, 12G that we've completed. 12H. Oh, you're not microphone yet. It's back to you for double conservation authority agreement. Thank you, Worship. This is an agreement with Grace Alba Conservation Authority for technical review services. The city through the province has a number of approval authorities related to a variety of land use planning matters. Conservation authorities similarly are delegated authority to represent the provincial interest for natural hazard. The city does rely on uh, input from the conservation authority staff. It's meaningful, it's timely, and they provide that expert advice uh, to our staff, particularly the development team on environmental and natural hazards. The fees under the agreement are paid for by the developer and remitted uh, uh, direct, directly then to Gray Solvable Conservation Authority. The recommendation your worship, worship is in consideration of the report that council would authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the agreement. What is that recommendation, your worship? Questions, uh, comments? I'm going to call the question, Councillor Dodd. Uh, Councillor Greg, you're in favor. Yep. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Kepke. In favor. Merton. Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. Good. That's carried. 12 H, 12 I. Back to you again, Pam, with regard to uh, the temporary agreement for rentals. Thank you, Worship. On March 30th, the city was contract, contacted by Enterprise Rent-A-Car respecting their need for 50 parking spaces for temporary use during the COVID emergency. The agreement provides for the use of 50 spaces at the Julie MacArthur Regional Recreation Center. 
The spaces have been selected so as not to block a fire route um, or any roadways. Uh, the agreement provides for liability and cross liability endorsement. And um, at the request of the city with three days notice, um, they would uh, remove all the vehicles. The recommendation your worship is that council approve a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the agreement. It's a way to support this, uh, this business at a difficult time. Councilor Thomas. I move that recommendation. Okay, any comments, questions? Question, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Greg. In favor. Or Hamley. In favor. Okay. In favor. In favor. Larry. In favor. Councillor Hamming. In favor. In favor. That brings us down to 12J. That's a report on Potter's Field Monument Design and Next Steps. Thank you, Worship. In September of 2018, Allie Boltman had made a compelling presentation at Community Services Committee regarding a private, generous donation of a monument to be placed in Potter's Field at Greenwood Cemetery. The city hosted a web page and all the background and uh, information and a survey, and Ms. Boltman hosted an open house in May of 2019 at Grey Roots Museum and Archives, as well as an online service survey to assist in informing the design. I just asked the clerk to go to the design of the monument at the end of the report. The proposed design is comprised of a window frame inset in black granite with the following inscription. We honor and dignify the memories of the more than, and it will read 1100 disadvantaged women, men and children who were buried here between 1858 and 1978. May they rest in peace. I would just like to take a few minutes to highlight the design elements as Ms. Boltman describes them. The monument pay, pays homage to the Black History Cairn located at Harrison Park through its inclusion of a window without being an exact copy. The design we have incorporated intri intrinsically linked, however, not identical in shape or size. While it is intended to evoke an image of the original BME church windows, this version is intended to impart a sense of moving through time and space from one world to another, from obscurity to dignity. The window also allows for natural beauty and the landscape of Greenwood Cemetery to be on display. Through the openness in the design, the pointed feature in the monument is also intended, if at all possible, to aim north because in considering the city's unique status as the terminus of the Underground Railway, north has historically represented freedom. The window will be cast in, in black bronze and the monument will be made from almost black um, uh, granite. The monument itself um, will be installed by uh, the producer, but the city staff will prepare the uh, the foundation and base at a cost of $800 plus uh, some staff time. In terms of the size of the monument, uh, at the current time, the maximum size for a monument in the cemetery is 60 inches wide by 38 inches tall. The proposed monument is about 96 inches wide and about 50 inches tall. And the recommendation, your worship, is that council would amend the schedule to the cemetery bylaw to allow monuments approved by resolution of council to commemorate a group of merit or event of historical significance to be exempt. Any uh, exempt, any monument exempt in schedule A would confirm to design guidelines set by the Ontario Monument Builders Association. And with that, your worship, um, I would recommend that council approve the design included um, as attachment one, that you would authorize staff to pour the monument foundation at a cost of $800 and that you would amend the Greenwood Cemetery bylaw to permit the monument dimensions detailed in the design. Thank you very much, Councillor Thomas. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I'll move this motion and in, in moving it, I'd like to just comment that this is the kind of project that makes me feel proud to say that I'm from Owen Sound. This is uh, by the community, for the community, and I think Ms. Boltman should be commended as well as her uh, anonymous donor for, for this wonderful job that they're doing. 
I had the opportunity to attend the uh, May open house at uh, Gray Roots, and I spoke with a number of family members of uh, people who have been buried in our potter's field. And I've got to tell you that this has meaning for them. This has deep meaning uh, to a person. The people I spoke to just were just over the moon with the fact that this was being done to honor and recognize their relatives uh, at long last, I'll say. So it's a pleasure to move it. I commend Ms. Boltman and her anonymous donor and all of the people who have been involved in this project. Any other comments from anyone? Call the question. All in favor? Councillor Dodd? In favor. Uh, uh, Greg? In favor. Hamley? In favor. Kepke? In favor. Tiffany? In favor. No, Larry? In favor. Councillor Tamming? In favor. Councillor Thomas? In favor. Councillor Thomas, I, I don't know if you know, I think maybe the first burial there was a guy named John Body. A lot of family members can trace their roots to uh, that family. Uh, 12K, Colter, I think, uh, with regard to, uh, is it the uh, campground refund policy? Thank you, Worship. Camping has been an important part of Har the Harrison Park experience since the 1920s, and today our camps campground includes uh, 100 modern sites with a variety of recreational amenities. We also have 100 sites at Kelso Beach Park. In 2019, we undertook our first ever online bookings. In 2019, there were just over 6,000 uh, rentals with an income that year of $268,000. Less than 2% of all bookings result in a request for refund or partial refund. And a summary of the main eight main reasons or common issues uh, resulting in a request for refund are provided in the report. The purpose of the report is to establish a policy that's transparent and provides a clear framework for addressing these requests for staff. Really just to remove the guesswork. We did look at policies from other uh, campgrounds in other communities and that summary of those policies is in attachment four. The draft policy is attached to the report. It includes a form that can be submitted electronically or in person to the campground booth. It would uh, requires that you submit it within seven days of uh, a booking if you've left. Um, you would it proposes a hundred percent refund uh, if you have fourteen days notice, a hundred percent credit if the notice is between seven and thirteen days, and no refund if it's between zero and six days. Uh, the policy also deals with late arrivals, uh, letting us hold the site for 24 hours. And then after that, uh, you would lose your, the booking. So the recommendation your worship is that council in consideration, in consideration of the staff report that council would adopt the campground refund policy and amend the parks bylaw to include the campground refund policy as schedule B to that, to that bylaw. Mayor Larry. Thank you, Your Worship. Happy to move that recommendation. And any questions from uh, Council? Comments? Anybody sneaking off to the fridge? Somebody got busted. Uh, I'm going to call the question, Councillor Dodd. It wasn't me. I have to be far away from the fridge, but uh, I'm in favor. Councillor Greg? In favor. Councillor Hamley? In favor. Welcome back, Councillor Kepke. Favor? Waiting for you, Councillor Kepke, if you can get your uh, microphone. Favor, thank you. There you go. Councillor Merton? In favor. Thank you, Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councillor Tamming? In favor. In favor. So that's uh, 12K that's done. We're down to uh, L technologist with regard to servicing agreement for numbered company. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, staff seeking council's permission and approval to enter into a service agreement with numbered company 2445595 Ontario Inc. The developer will be constructing a hotel at 1216th Avenue West and a hotel to refer to as API Hotel. 
the service connections of this property to the city infrastructure requires the developer to enter into a service agreement with the city. The agreement details construction standards, practices, and inspection requirements to ensure services are constructed properly and in conformance with provincial and city standards. The agreement also stipulates the need for a the developer to provide a securities in the amount of $57,341, uh, which the developer has done. Thank you. I'll move the recommendation, Your Worship. Thank you. Questions from Council? Comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Councilor Dodd. My apologies, in favor. Okay, thank you, Councilor Greg. In favor. Councilor Hamley. In favor. Councilor Kepke. In favor. Councilor Merton. In favor. Councilor Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councilor Hamming. In favor. In favor. So that is carried. We're down to 12M, which is subdivision agreement with uh, ANPET. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is a bit of a housekeeping item. The report is seeking Council's approval to revise the existing agreement between ANPET and the City that was just recently signed. This will allow for the securities to be released on a sliding scale as work is completed. The plan is to reduce the amount of securities based on the monthly payment certificates issued by the contractor and approved by the development team. A minimum security amount of $318,935 will be retained until the end of the maintenance period. Thank you, Worship. I'll move that recommendation. Okay, any questions from Council? Council Merton? I just want to clarify, by approving this, we're actually approving a precedent. This has this sliding scale has not been in place before. Am I correct? Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the question. I believe in the past we've done it based on uh, phasing of projects when there's uh, larger phases. Uh, this is something unique, but well within our, our prerogative. Uh, it will allow the developer to um, be more financially liquid. liquid. I'm trying to think of a good word. Liquidated? Liquid. He'd have more income uh, available to him as he progresses through the project. Um, it's very similar to phasing it, whether we say you're phasing one part of the development, uh, say uh, 40 houses and the next to 40 houses and that sort of thing. This way we'd be doing probably on a monthly uh, uh, monthly basis. So as those payment certificates come in, we'll look at it and say, okay, we know we can reduce the uh, securities in place because they're the, the uh, developer's engineer has approved it and said it's done and we'll go out and inspect it as well to make sure we're all on the same page. But I think this is working with the developer to get this project done and uh, based on, you know, conversations with both the developer and his uh, contractor. We're as soon as we feel that this project can be done in probably 12 to 16 weeks uh, and then they could be out of there and, and looking to. Uh, uh, continue with the next phases of their uh, development, which is a, is a great development given the area has been uh, been sitting there for quite some time. It's a great infill property uh, it, and it'll really provide, uh, uh, you know, both uh, single family homes, uh, rental properties and uh, and uh, senior citizens or retirement home, which I think would benefit the city greatly. Thank you. Anyone else questions? The question, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Greg. In favor. Hamley. Uh, in favor. Councillor Kepke. In favor. Burton. In favor. O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Hamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. So that is carried. Now we're down to 12N, which is a report. Regard to procedural bylaw emergency meeting provision. Thank you, Your Worship. The Ontario government has provided for an expansion of electronic meetings during periods in which an emergency has been declared by the municipality or the province. 
Staff are recommending that the procedural bylaw be amended to allow local boards to meet electronically. Since local boards are the final decision makers, they are unable to move any business forward without meeting. This would include the DIA board specifically. City committees are not being considered at this time because council is the ultimate decision maker and resources are currently limited. The recommendation in the report is to direct staff to bring forward a bylaw to include emergency meeting provisions as outlined in the report. Move that recommendation, Your Worship. Council, any questions? Councillor Tamming, go ahead. Uh, th thanks, Madam Clerk. As you know, I've emailed you back and forth. I'm chair of the um, the advisory committee for the uh, the Tom. Um, when you say resources are limited, can can you just talk about that? Because uh, I'd love to have this same bylaw allowing us to meet. Especially, especially, I think it's a shame because we have Aiden who just started today, and uh, it's a shame with a brand new director not to be able to sort of launch with face to faces. Can you just speak to that for a minute, Madam Clerk, when we might be able to get that done? And what the what the limited resources uh, issue is? I'll perhaps uh, assist the clerk with, with this one, Your Worship. It's, it's a number of limited resources. Certainly the admin assistants who support most committees are uh, very much working from home, most of them. Uh, I think you heard earlier tonight, our IT staff have been doing yeoman service for this community. And every time we have a meeting or get ready for a meeting with outside bodies, they have to make sure it all works for us. Um, so those are the resources specifically, Councillor. I would say, I believe if there is one other committee that could benefit from, from meeting currently in this, uh, circumstance. It is the art gallery board. We do have a new director. Certainly uh, just started today. I can inform council of the public. Uh, I look forward to what she can can uh, help the gallery move ahead. And if council would allow, I might ask for the clerk if it's poss possible to add committees, but I'm talking specifically in this case of the art gallery committee and I will check with RT if I can we're working to get that committee going. Um, I know it's a, a late change, but uh, I know the curator is eager to get going. She doesn't know her, her committee, and it might be very beneficial for us to get off and running as well. But I'll defer to the clerk if we have to wait two weeks to bring that forward. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ritchie. I, I'm not seeking, you know, a favoritism for the committee, but but I, I just out of courtesy to Aiden again, and uh, I thank you for that consideration. Your Worship, because this hasn't wasn't part of my report and council hasn't had an opportunity to consider this request, I would suggest that um, I will be bringing forward a report at our next meeting to look at a couple of other committees. I know there's been concern expressed regarding committee of adjustment as well as the accessibility advisory committee because there are certain legislative requirements um, that accessibility needs to meet on. So I could include that in my report at the next meeting for uh, council to to look at. So any other councillors wish to uh, comment on the uh, report that's before us tonight? Seeing anyone, well, I'm seeing people waving their hands, but I think they already spoke. Um, <laughs> call the question, Councillor Dodd. In favor. Councillor Gregg. In favor. Councillor Hamley. In favor. Kepke. In favor. Mr. Merton. In favor. Councillor Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Tamming. Councillor Tamming, didn't hear you. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. In favor. So we're down to. The uh, or update from uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary on Gray County Council last week. Okay, then Ms. Clovo. Great. First, we uh, back to uh, Ms. Bloomfield with appointments to Owen Sound DIA. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. The Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area Board is comprised of two members of Council and eight members of the general public who are recommended by the Board and approved by Council. There is currently a vacancy on the Board due to a resignation. 
The board reviewed the applications and passed a resolution recommending that two individuals be appointed to the board and that the public members on the board be increased from eight to nine. The recommendation in this report is to direct staff to bring forward a bylaw to appoint Walid Islam and Winifred Walcott to the DIA board with terms to begin immediately and end on November 14th, 2022, and to increase the number of public members from eight to nine. I move the recommendation. Be any discussion, Council? I'm seeing no one put their hands up. Councillor Dodd, in favor? In favor. Greg? In favor. For Hamley? In favor. For Kepke? In favor. Burton? In favor. Deputy Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councillor Hamming? In favor. Thomas? In favor. That's carried. So that gets us through 12 0 now down to the, uh, the oral report from Deputy Mayor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Uh, we had a rather sobering report from Director of Economic Development, Tourism and Culture, Savannah Myers. Global pandemic has led to an unprecedented times for our communities. This is different than a recession or an economic slowdown with reduced revenues and limited growth. Gray County has a little over 10,500 businesses. Over 300 businesses responded to the Gray County business, business Survey, and the results <clears throat> were rather staggering. Our small businesses are in trouble, and some may not recover without some kind of help. Gray County has an economic development working group in place since 2015, headed up by Savannah Myers. We in Owen Sound are a little more fortunate than some of the other eight municipalities as we have a manager of community development and marketing, in Savannah's words, it's very helpful to have someone in the municipality that knows their businesses and has a feel for strengths and witnesses. Brent Fisher has a good rapport with our local businesses and, and with the city and DIA partnership has the opportunity to work hand in hand with the DIA board. This working group began coordinating efforts beginning on March 17th to keep messages consistent and businesses informed. County staff are in, a con in constant contact with municipal staff working more closely now than ever. On April 8th, Warden McQueen sent a letter to MPP Bill Walker and MP Alex Ruff outlining concern for the business community regarding bank and credit card fees. On April 16th, staff launched a formal call-in option for businesses looking for assistance or an ear to navigate programs to help to pivot their business. That number, by the way, is 519-372-0219, extension 1270. Staff are participating, are participating in weekly RTO7 meetings with our neighbors in Bruce and Simcoe to coordinate messaging, share trends and best practices, as well as sharing recovery options for the region. The Economic Development Group is meeting again on May 8th to begin a recovery. One of my on uh, one of my duties as county councillor is to sit on the board of health, and I wanted to extend my sincerest appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Ian Ara. I stay in touch with him a couple times a week, and can assure everyone that currently he might just be the busiest man in Gray Bruce. He's a man of character. He takes criticism with grace, and with all the chaos during this pandemic, has the compassion to sit down and write a heartfelt letter to all frontline workers in long-term care homes, thanking them for what they are doing. Dr. Ara is our medical officer of health and through his calm demeanor is leading us through this emergency. He is in constant contact with Gray and Bruce counties, municipal leaders, and the media. On behalf of One Sound Council, I thank you, Dr. Ara, for your strength and leadership. Any questions for uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary? And I encourage everyone to go to the uh, Gray County uh, agenda and look at that report from uh, Savannah. I, I think I shared it with council, but for anyone in the public, there's also a really good uh, website that the uh, county is managing that uh, it gives you, uh, if you want to actually look at some of the surveys that have been done, gives you the information, the uh, connections with things. So that'll be at uh, gray.ca slash COVID-19, I think. But if you go to uh, gray.ca, you can find it uh, from there. So. It's it's good information happening around uh, Gray County and within the city. Onesound.ca, of course, is the other one you can go to to get good information. 
going to uh, the consent agenda next. And as we said, your worship, the consent agenda includes a business license for Balfour property restoration, which has relocated to 2120 20th Avenue East, and the information package. Thank you. Mayor, moving that. Uh, Move by myself that City Council receives item 13A and 13B on the consent agenda dated April 27th. City Councilor Dodd, all in favor? Favor. Councilor Greg? In favor. Hamley? In favor. Kepke? In favor. Jeans? In favor. Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councilor Tamming? In favor. Uh, Councilor Thomas? In favor. So that's carried. So we're down to 14 and we no, have no committee minutes. Number 15, we have no postponed matters. Number 16, we have no motions for which notice was previously given. Down to 17, which is additional business. Councilor Greg, you had an uh, item or two? Thanks, Chip. I do have an item here uh, tonight. It's um been brought to my attention yeah, in the last four or five weeks because this gentleman was wanting to make a deputation to council regarding his concerns on uh, the purchase of the aerial fire truck. Um, subsequently, he was scheduled to make a deputation of corporate services. However, that uh, COVID uh, beginning has uh, not allowed him a platform. So he's disseminated some emails to council and uh, I met with this gentleman with his concern and when we purchased the aerial fire truck last October of 2019 uh, I was part of that decision uh, and I'm not saying it's the wrong decision I'm not saying it's the right decision I'm going to discuss the procedure we got to it um, we have uh, fire services goes through the corporate services committee and uh, it was referred for reference that we had a um, fleet, uh, what should I call it, a fleet, um, a fleet report done in 2017, providing direction for the fire um, truck replacements. When I went back and started to do a little bit of research uh, to look at this gentleman's questions and concerns, that fleet replacement report consisted of about three sentences that I could find on the budget card for the A4 replacement. Uh, it was part of the paragraph above the picture of the fire truck, so not a lot. And every five, every budget year, we are provided the five-year capital plan. And this is from the minutes, and we get this every year. The director of corporate services explained that the five year capital plan for all departments has been provided to council for information. Approval of the capital budget is completed on an annual basis. So while we have that five year capital plan in front of us, we don't spend any real time discussing it because it's exactly that for information. What I'm questioning here is and i did speak with the fire chief and he explained to me his rationale on the purchase and the recommendation it being a hundred foot mid-mount aerial this gentleman's information is also very good um, we did the tender in the late summer of 2019 before council had done budget approval on the purchase of the fire truck and we effectively closed the tender and um, passed the bylaw on the purchase of it in October of 2019. We didn't actually have this purchase come to budget until 2020 budget deliberations. So the, the um, suggestion that because it takes 16 months to build a fire truck, I would strongly argue uh, does not permit us to circumvent the procedure that we have in place to bring and to make these kind of purchases. I guess what I'd like to hear from the city manager is uh, 
why did we buy a fire truck or do a tender on it before council had actually authorized through the budget process the the purchase of the fire truck that that's my first question i guess here and and i'm not saying and this gentleman hasn't said anything derogatory at all about our fire chief he was more than kind um, and considerate in uh, acknowledging the communications the fire chief has had back to to him on this as well as the city manager uh, but i know from my past when we did the A4 replacement, I spoke with a longtime captain of the fire department, and he was a big proponent of the 75 foot ladder squirt truck that we replaced to um, with a pumper. So, you know, you can get a lot of input from a lot of experienced individuals. Uh, I was on a council that we had a really strong director looking at after the art gallery. Keep moving here. And uh, it, it could be reminded tonight how much money we're trying to restore that we lost a few years ago. Um, so I'll leave it uh, at that right now. Mr. Ritchie, do you wish to reply? I, I certainly do, Your Worship. Um, fire Chief Doug Barfoot has over 30 years' experience as a firefighter, captain, and fire chief. No one has a better understanding of the current fleet. Our current firefighters and their training as well he has a thorough knowledge of the fleet available to our mutual aid agreement he has often been on the fire ground and continues to be he also reviews incoming site plans and future development agreements to understand how our force can react today and tomorrow to serve the needs of our community chief barfoot recommended the specifications of the truck that was ordered as our best investment to protect our community and support the recommend, and I support that recommendation. I might go on to say the fire chief in this town and every town has a tremendous onus on them to provide a service and the equipment that will protect their community. God forbid if there's ever an inquest, it will be the fire chief and it will be council that has to respond, why did your equipment not fit that need? It won't be anecdotal captain it won't be individuals that that contest that purchase i feel very strongly about that um moving on to the purchasing your purchase your manager of procurement who is highly regarded by her peers and in fact instructs municipal procurement procurement to upcoming purchasing professionals has reviewed the process to purchase this equipment and cannot find something very wrong with the process there is a point and i believe on this purchase we are at that point Complainants need to send their complaints to the office of the Ombudsman of Ontario. We would review the complaint and we would have closure to this issue. I've spoken to this individual a number of times. I've spoken to this individual for the last time as city manager on this purchase of the fire truck. The chief has spoken to him numerous times, as has our manager of purchase. I have confidence in where we are and how we've gotten there in this purchase. I have confidence in the staff that works for me. All I have to say on that purchase. Do I have another uh, different topic there, Councillor Greg? I can't remember if you said two things or one thing. No, I think it's probably due to the audio. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tamming. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I won't be long. I just wanted to echo what, um, what Brian or Councillor O'Leary said. I went to the public health unit Friday and this morning at the invitation of Dr. Era just to see firsthand um, the control center for, for this COVID crisis. And I wanna say a couple things, three observations. First of all, I can't speak highly enough about Dr. Era. And uh, I've done a, a piece about him in the Sun Times and uh, hopefully they'll print it. Email me if you want a copy. But I was pleased to know that this doctor knows Northern Ontario, he knows rural Ontario, and he, uh, he knows epidemiology cold. It's what he's trained for. And we are well served by a gentleman who, for instance, is not a former uh, family physician, for instance, who's become a director of health. He lives for uh, this sort of thing. He lives for epidemiology and everything it represents. Uh, in speaking to him, I learned that uh, he knows the data that's important coming into the unit and just as important that which is useless. 
And there's a lot of social media discussion out there, a lot of emails that are circulating and so forth about this number or that number and why aren't you doing this and so forth. I was very impressed that he's in his wheelhouse. He's nimble. He's eager to try new approach approaches and he's uh, he's he, he just has enormous credibility. So I'll just I'll just echo what uh, uh, Mr. O'Dekenster O'Leary said. As good as he is, Dr. Era would freely admit, though, that whether to open up our economy or not and get Walker's Landing going or get Mudtown going or get anything up and going again is above his pay grade. It's not up to him or the white coats uh, to balance medical risk with the importance of holding a job or having a culture. And I just remind everybody listening tonight that we have canceled the Salmon Spectacular, not we, but it's been canceled. I just got an email two hours ago, some summer folk is done. Uh, this city is shutting down in profound ways that, that has not happened for 50 years, I suspect. And those decisions, that balancing act um, has to come not from the medical field solely, but it's a balancing act between the medical people and politicians and economists. And there's nothing wrong as this crisis develops with citizens, residents and counselors voicing their opinions directly through Bill Walker or to cabinet or, or to the AMO and suggesting that maybe this is being done wrong. Maybe this restriction needs to be lifted and so forth. I know a man who can't operate his car wash. I know a couple that is uh, terrified of getting fined for walking the Bruce Trail, just the two of them. Canadians have a deserved reputation for being uh, for being uh, dutiful. We respect authority. Uh, our country is founded on those principles, and I don't mean to undermine that at all. But we do have every right to step up and say these restrictions. It's time that we start lifting some of them, perhaps at a more accelerated speed than is being proposed. I get it that those decisions are to be made at Queen's Park but we certainly have a right to raise our voices. And I just wanna remind us of that. The third observation I just wanna make is that this crisis I think is gonna teach us the value of having a local Grey Bruce health unit. I know there's talk of mergers, but when I walked around the floor the other day and again this morning, and I saw what they're up to, I get that they get rural health, they get our Aboriginal communities, they get our Amish communities, I noticed a, uh, a team of contact tracers, and it's good, by the way, that there's only, I think, 80 now positives that they have to trace, but it's good to see the local people doing local analysis on a local contacting. And if this was being done by London or Goderich or Clinton or wherever, I don't think it would have the same punch. So I, for one, am exceedingly proud of our health unit, and I'm really happy that somebody with... Uh, Mr. O'Leary's uh, passion and intelligence that he's our city rep. We're being well served on that committee. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I hadn't originally planned on saying anything in other business, but I think it would be remiss of us not as a council to give a big shout out to our clerk's department and to our IT department what a difference between the last meeting and this meeting. Uh, we really, really, truly appreciate the hard work that you put into making sure that the meeting went a little more smoothly and I'll be happy to go home tonight without a headache. Uh, I was just going to hit those same things. Uh, IT not only have they got us up and running twice, uh, they also got the uh, field hospital set up so that all the equipment for, the, uh, for that would work and all the computers and everything that would go with that, as well as all of our staff working from home, dealing with the council, which is probably more of a headache than just staff uh, getting us set up with our iPads to attend uh, meetings like this. So they've been very busy as uh, really have uh, so many people. Uh, also want to thank uh, Dr. Era. He, uh, we have a meeting at Gray County and lower tier uh, staff are sitting in listening every week and he's uh, explaining things and uh, very complicated things in a great way that we understand and keeping everybody informed. We're getting our daily reports. To the hospital and their staff, they got that uh, hospital, field hospital, set up in a very short period of time. They haven't been overwhelmed as they expected to be. Some of the long-term care homes have been overwhelmed. 
We raised almost 200 volunteers at the hospital when they asked them amongst all of staff uh, if they would be willing to go to a long-term care uh, help and spread out their ability uh, to, to help others that are working in uh, providing health care services and, uh, and helping. They had 200 people that volunteered, which was a great statement about our community. I know that's something that uh, Mr. Walker was going back to uh, his cabinet meeting to uh, boast about because no one else in Ontario has had that kind of movement where nurses uh, and people are working together in long-term care in uh, retirement homes and other group homes to uh, help each other share information, keep them informed, and it's working really well as a team cooperating with each other. Um, we feel badly for everyone that is in long-term care and uh, their families and in retirement homes because your habit or uh, ability to go and visit your parents has been disrupted and it's hard on the parents and it's hard on the kids. Um, so we're thinking of you in these times. We're also thinking of those people that have um, been infected by COVID in some of those long-term care homes. There's one in particular here in the city, but I think we've had a couple across uh, Graham Bruce. We all worry about those people and especially the family. So our thoughts are definitely uh, with you day to day. Um, council and the government uh, around here can throw in a hospital which increases the capacity. We're increasing the supply of beds and uh, we're ready if things got get worse. Um, but really, the other side of it is really the demand that has been in the control of the community in Owen Sound and throughout Graham Bruce. And that's where the big thank you goes to absolutely everybody that has been disciplined, you've sacrificed, you've uh, maintained your social distancing, you're washing your hands, all those things have been required. And as a result, the uh, demand for beds has not been there yet. So big kudos to the community. I'm gonna go to a, um, a quote that was sent to us by, uh, by the city, the county council by uh, Kim Wingrove, the uh, CAO at Gray County today. She referred to a uh, Harvard University professor, Rosemary Moss Cantor, uh, who gave this situation a name, miserable middle of change. So we're seven weeks into this, we don't know when we're coming out of it. In a uh, famed 2009 blog post for Harvard Business Review, quote, Everything looks like a failure in the middle. Everyone uh, loves inspiring beginnings, and happy endings. It's just the middle that involves hard work. So today we're in the middle. We're in the middle of this, and uh, this is the time that we all want to say, oh, I'm tired of this, I got cabin fever, I want to quit. School oh, won't really matter if I go and visit my friends. It still does. Keeping those numbers low because we've been really good as a community to this point. Our numbers per capita are lower than a lot of other places, Toronto, a lot of other places, Ontario, and certainly the states. We've got to keep going. We don't know how much longer we're going to go. You heard tonight, council is looking at uh, what the cost has been to this. We will look uh, going forward at how we're going to recover, how we're going to adjust to this as new information comes in. But for now, we've all got to stick to our guns and just keep going and doing what we've been doing. It's working. We can take pride in the fact that it's working. Take pride in the fact that uh, we're part of this, that uh, we're one big hockey team. I know uh, Coach O'Leary will say, if you're up 3-1 uh, in a series, the next game's the hardest one. You've got to keep going to get that fourth game. And you can't give up and you can't lose your discipline. So please keep going, keep working at it. The weather's going to get better. Make sure that we keep those numbers low because the uh, lower we can keep them, the sooner we can get the doors open on the stores we want to go to, the restaurants we want to go to, and, uh, and be able to start to uh, see our family members uh, somehow other than Skype and uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, Telebubblies. Skype cocktail parties on Saturday afternoons. Telebubblies. Telebubblies. So thank you huge to everybody in the, the community in you know, Owen Sound and throughout Graham Bruce. It's, uh, we're doing a great job, just keep it going. So thank you. Oh, down to number 18. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself that the Committee of the Whole rise and report. Councillor Dodd, in favor? I didn't quite hear you. 
You're on and off. All right. In favor. Councilor Greg. In favor. Hamley. In favor. Kepke. In favor. Merton. In favor. Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Councilor Tamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. So that is carried. We're now rising and reporting, going into the formal session. So a motion to adopt proceedings. Thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thomas, that the action taken in committee of the whole and considering public meetings, deputations, and presentations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports of city staff, consent agenda, committee minutes, matters postponed, notice, motions for which notice was previously given, additional business be confirmed by this council. Councillor Dodd? In favor? Greg? In favor? Emily. In favor. Kepke. In favor. Burton. In favor. Mayor O'Leary. In favor. Hamming. In favor. Thomas. In favor. So that uh, gets a uh, motion proceeding is passed. That's uh, uh, notices of motion. Any councillors have any notices of motion for the next meeting? None. So now 21 bylaws, Ms. Bloomfield. Your Worship, the bylaws listed for approval on tonight's agenda include the confirmatory bylaw, a bylaw to establish the city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a bylaw to execute an agreement with 2470566 Ontario Inc. for the operation of a regional transit system with an own sound, a bylaw to execute an agreement with Enterprise Rent-A-Car Canada Company for the use of land at the Julie MacArthur Regional Recreation Centre, Bylaw to ratify an employment agreement with Timothy Simmons for the city manager position. A bylaw to amend the procedural bylaw to provide for electronic participation in meetings of local boards during declared emergencies. And a bylaw to amend the boarding committee bylaw to increase the number of public members on the DIA board and to appoint Walida Slam and Winifred Walcott to the DIA board. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thomas, that bylaw numbers 2020 039 040. 041, 042, 043, 044, 045 be passed and entered. In favor, Councillor Dodd? In favor. Greg? In favor. Councillor Hamley? In favor. Councillor Kepke? In favor. Burton? In favor. Deputy Mayor O'Leary? In favor. Councillor Hamming? In favor. Councillor Thomas? Well, bylaws are passed. We have completed all of our uh, duties and work for tonight, so we can adjourn at 920. Good work. Thanks, everybody.